Okay. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to this exclusive, and I do mean exclusive, press event hosted by Bar Convent Brooklyn and sponsored by our amazing colleagues at the Italian Trade Agency and in collaboration with Colangelo and Partners. My name is Carlos Rodriguez, and I'm the event director for Bar Convent Brooklyn. And with us today are Livio Laro, today's amazing and awesome speaker, Paola Pavan, and Daniela Porro from the Italian Trade Agency, and finally, Trade Commissioner Antonino Laspina, who will tell you a little Hi, bit everybody. about their organization. Hi, Antonino. Before we start, I wanted to share a quick few housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, I want to let you know that we are recording today's webinar and that we will be sending out an email with the recording to you tomorrow. If you're having any difficulty at all hearing us and are listening through your computer, for example, please make sure that your speaker volume is turned up. If you're still facing, if facing issues, you can message us using the chat box, which is located on the right hand of your screen. Also on the right hand of your screen, you will see a PDF handout called BCB Around the Boot um, that you can use to follow along uh, with today's presentation. And of course, as usual, at any time, please feel free to ask any questions using that same chat box. And we'll, we've got time designated for Q&A at the end. With all of that being said, let me now please hand it over to Trade Commissioner, Mr. Laspina. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for this introduction, Carlos. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, all the people of the press and uh, whoever has uh, made possible for us to organize this event and for taking the time to join us today. We are very excited because we have been partnering uh, with uh, Bar Convent Brooklyn to promote uh, Italian spirits. Uh, we have been using uh, high quality of professionals uh, and we are confident of the fact that although we cannot have event like traditionally we have uh, organized in uh, order to promote Italian goods and uh, Italian spirits, but this formula of having educational webinar I think is going to pave the way for um, an increase of the sales of the Italian goods. But first of all, in uh, making possible for an increasing number of people of knowing the peculiarity and the special character, I would say, or the special spirit of the Italian spirits. So this is, I think, something very important. Oh, I think the educational webinar is very important because, as I already mentioned, the Italian spirits have a certain peculiarity. They are the result. They are the uh, result of a tradition that started uh, in Italy several centuries ago. Then it was perfected by the um, industrial activity. But even in the industrial era, I think the manufacturers, the producers have been able to keep the original spirit of having uh, original combination, uh, the, the use of special herbs. So. I would like to say that um, if we are looking for something that is green, if we are looking for something that is natural, I think that Italian spirits can be, if you want, uh, a very modern and ancient or old response to this kind of needs. But without further elaborating on this uh, aspect, because I think Livio Lalo is going to give you the perfect uh, explanation of what is the tradition and where the Italian factories are located, and which one is the tradition for each one of these products and how you can enjoy in a better way of what you know at the moment, this particular spirit from Italy. I would like to say that this educational webinar actually is coming after three previous webinars that we had on the 24th, the 27th and the 31st of August. So this has been a series, um, an, an attitude that as Italian trade agency, we are going to develop in this uh, phase that we call the digital era. We cannot reach the people, we cannot reach the buyers, we cannot reach the people of the press with the event like uh, the fancy food in San Francisco, many other events, because we cannot do event in person. Nevertheless, I would like to focus on the fact that we are continuing our activity. We are cultivating this kind of relationship with the uh, people of the press, we are cultivating a relationship with the buyers, with the traders, we are waiting for the possibility of having, I hope, pretty soon uh, traditional events. But I think meanwhile, you, I will invite you to look at the Italian Trade Agency as an agency that is uh, operating uh, with the staff, with uh, 
Gioia Gatti with Daniela Porro and all the staff that is involved in two activities that are going to pave the way for what is going to be the new normal. So we are continuing to work. Anything you need in terms of information, please, you ask us what is the kind of information. We can put you in touch with any Italian manufacturers producer that is interested in this uh, sector of the spirits. Having said that, I thank you again very much for your mm -hmm. participation. And I think that I have to give the floor to Livio. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I appreciate um, your very kind words, Commissioner. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good day to be in front of you because I was, of all the seminars we've hosted, this one here is the one that gets me the most exciting. I've been anxiously waiting for this one. You see, my name is Livio, and of course, I think we've all uh, covered that already, but I grew up on a small island in southern Italy called Ischia. It's a very happy place, but the world when I lived there was very, very small. Uh, I grew up as a bartender and as a consumer, so I have experienced Italian food and liqueurs and cocktail and aperitivi uh, on both sides of the bar, but uh, I, I still, I lived on a little island, and in 1994, when I moved to Rome uh, to join the Italian army, uh, it was just three hours away, and I already felt like I was a world away. Uh, now I'm looking, you know, almost uh, 25 years ahead, and I have this opportunity to speak to so many people uh, about the amazing products that Italy makes and the people behind it and the beautiful regions and their food. And uh, it's nothing shy of an absolute pleasure. And in times like this, the fact that you all uh, are here with us today to uh, listen to me talk and to discuss these regions and these amazing products uh, is also a very big pleasure. So thank you very much. And do forgive me for my enthusiasm. And if I get a little notch above the energy level that I should be, I'm going to just justify myself by saying that you know, the beverages and the drinking culture of Italy are so fascinating that the temptation is way too much. Now, why is that a thing? Why is Italy so fascinating? Well, because it's, it's safe to say that Italy forged uh, a lot of how we drink today, uh, dating back to the 1100s at the University of Salerno in Southern Italy, where the med med medical practitioners were uh, studying and developing medical-based beverages already almost a thousand years ago. And of course, those then evolved into tasty beverages the way we taste them to set today. As, and as you can see from most of them, or most of the ones we will be talking today, those medicinal herbs that are meant to enhance your life and make you happier and make you speak louder and make you move your hands are still part of the beverages today. Also, of course, Italy brings us this beautiful aperitivo ritual which is slowly but surely making its way around the world and when when a when a cultural phenomenon is tied into a global ritual things just become so much more fascinating and amazing um, this uh, webinar is very interactive please do feel free to comment uh, give me any questions you can i will be checking in occasionally to see if there are any questions so that we can address them as we go. I'll also leave a little bit at the end uh, of this webinar so that we can, uh, if there's any uh, additional questions. And just think about all the wonderful cocktails out there without even uh, discussing liqueurs and spirits and wines and other types of beverages. Think about a world without the Manhattan. Think about the world without a Negroni. Think about the world without a Americano or without a Boulevardier or the hanky panky, uh, what, what, what would this look like? And all of these cocktails have in common that at the forefront, there's an Italian uh, product. So um, I'm happy to take you through a tour of Italy today. Uh, my Vespa here is ready. So we're gonna be jumping on my Vespa. And uh, if again, if you have any questions or comments, please, please do 
uh, feel free to ask any. Uh, before I start, let's talk just a little bit briefly about Italy. Of course, it's in Southern Europe. It is bordered by four seas and to the north of it lies France, Switzerland, Austria, and Slovenia. About 60 million people live in Italy, but about 61 million visit it every year. And so um, that is actually a big number because I'm always impressed. I live here in Las Vegas now. I'm always impressed by the amount of tourists we have here in Vegas. And uh, Italy has more. And, and that's, a, that's a, a very fascinating number for me. Um, of course, for the 60 million people that live there and the tourists, food and drinks, along with, of course, football and, uh, and, uh, and fashion, uh, play such a big role. Um, Italy is divided in 20 regions, which are made of little provinces that are then split into towns. And some of these major towns are called communes. So region, province, town, commune, it can get a little bit confusing, but um, everything at the end of the day is a town. In, 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 uh, in Italy, we use many terms, ogni mondo è paese, or everything boils down. It's really, really, uh, everything we do boils down to our area and our people and what our area has to offer for those people uh, to do what they do every day. Uh, we'll be visiting eight regions today from north to south. We'll start in Piemonte or Piedmont, then we'll go to Lombardy, then we'll go to Veneto, Emilia Romagna, Marche, Lazio, Campania, and Basilicata. We are basically zigzagging our way from north to south, and that is very fascinating. Um, Daniela, before I jump in, are there any comments, any questions that we have that I should address? Uh, yes, there is one. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderfully. Okay. Perfect. Um, Jeanette asked, what is the least known aperitivo outside Italy? The least known aperitivo outside of Italy. So aperitivo as a cocktail or as a liqueur? As a liqueur, um, you know, the aperitivo, it's a very large question that I should probably answer at the end, but an aperitivo can be three things, right? It can be a beverage that is labeled an, aper an aperitivo. It can be a ritual known as l'aperitivo, so a, 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 an event that is social gathering. And it can also be any type of beverage that a person chooses to drink before food. So you can have a beer as an aperitivo or a glass of fumante or prosecco as an aperitivo. So it's it's all of those three. Um, and uh, I would say the most uncommon one that we've been talking about since we've started here is uh, a cocktail called il pir Pirlo, which is made in Brescia. And it's a, it's a very popular uh, Italian aperitivo cocktail. It is uh, said, and I don't really want much to be part of that battle, but it, that it predates the spritz. Um, but it's very popular in, in Brescia. And Pirlo basically means what happens when you dump the bitter liqueur, uh, in, in most cases Campari, inside of the cocktail. The cocktail is made of white wine, about three ounces of local white wine. Very important. Local dry unoaked wine, right? A, a splash of soda water and the Campari that Pirlo's or falls inside. It's a quintessential aperitivo cocktail. And uh, I, I believe that is the next big one we're gonna hear a lot about uh, here in America. And thank you for the question. Please keep them coming. Anything else? No, Paul, go to the floor of yours. Grazie. Sorry, if anybody asks questions, I'm very long-winded, okay? So set, set, you know, set, set, the, set aside some extra time. So we're gonna start in Piemonte, which is in Italy's Northwest. It borders Switzerland and France. Um, this land is surrounded by the Alps on three sides, and it has the highest uh, peaks uh, and the largest glaciers of Italy. Um, the dishes that are famous here are that we would recognize in America are gnocchi, vitello tonnato, typically food that is very rich uh, and very bold and, you know, big meals. Um, the, this region for drinking is very, is, is very, uh, cool for a, a couple of reasons. It has a very rich apresky culture because, of course, we're in the Alps. There's mountains. There's a lot of skiing. So all the post-skiing activity 
including drinking warm cocktails and heating up wine in what is called the vin, vin brule, which also has other ingredients in it, um, is, is extremely rich. But it's also here where vermouth was created. And vermouth um, is the quintessential aperitivo. So the aperitivo was predominantly born in this area. So between the apreski, which is what you do after you ski, and the aperitivo, which is what you do before you drink a meal, um, there's a lot of drinking uh, done in this region. Um, there's a very cool company that was actually created here too, that if we were in this area, we would go visit in Torino and it's called the spiritual machine it's an innovative company and again it's based in torino and it was created by a group of people that was very innovative and what they um thought of which was very important was they wanted to make sure that italian liqueurs are preserved and made in a way that is still authentic to their roots and made with premium natural ingredients and so this company actually helps anybody who wants to either start a liqueur brand of Italian nature or resurge old Italian liqueurs that might have disappeared from little towns, villages, grandmas, aunts, uncles, uh, great grandfathers, all of that. And so it helps those people do that. It's an innovative uh, company. And so, um, you know, if you want, if you uh, if you want to uh, hear more about them, of course, you can go on the internet, the spiritual the spiritual machine from Torino, and they they're they're they they're extremely nice, and they have a hundred years of over a hundred years of experience in creating these liqueurs. Again, um, not a product you can drink. A very nice, innovative company that helps make sure that what we will be drinking will continue to have natural and uh, traditional resources from the land that they should be coming from. Uh, also in this, uh, in this uh, region, in a town called Moncalieri, there's a little family owned uh, distillery that produces a new product that you may or may not have seen before called Italicus. Italicus, oh, I'm spinning the wrong way. Italicus Rosolio di Bergamotto. It's a Rosolio liqueur made with the Calabrian Bergamot and the Sicilian Cedro. It's blended with neutral Italian spirit and it comes at 20% alcohol by volume, which is, obviously relatively low in alcohol, easy drinking, very sessionable, very aperitivo friendly, whether it's your afternoon aperitivo, because you have to remember in Italy, we drink aperitivos uh, or aperitivi uh, a little, we, we have two occasions uh, most of the times. So your afternoon aperitivi, the one you have after, before your lunch break or after, right before your lunch break, uh, this is a perfect product, but of course, if you mix it with higher proof spirits, such as in a in a in a Negroni uh, with gin and the sweet vermouth, then you can also have a more boozy version of it. Some of the ingredients that you will find uh, in this product include chamomile, lavender, gentian, yellow roses, and Melissa balm. So, what is Rosolio? Well, Rosolio actually predates vermouth. It's an ancient liqueur and it was known as the liqueur of the women because predominantly it was the women in the household and the nuns in the monasteries who produced rosolio the base ingredient of a of most rosolio is alcohol sugar rose petals and water right and then you can flavor the rosolio with whatever your local ingredients uh, would be. As, a, as an example for this product here, the Melissa balm is actually a, a popular ingredient in Tori or in Piedmont. So there's probably a local component to the Rosolio. Now, the Rosolio was also a, a composition of ingredients made from other regions. So it's a, it's a wonderful Italian bottled cocktail. Um, it's also a very important way that was used to say, you're welcome to my house. So a bottle of Rosolio or a glass of Rosolio was a very warm welcome. And for those of you who, of course, who have, um, uh, you know, skin in the game in the hospitality or like to write about hospitality um, influ uh, related topics, right? You know, we have the topic of primacy and recency. Primacy is what happens before an event and recency is what happens 
after an event, right? Those can be more impactful than the event itself. And so handing somebody a rosolio when they walk in, welcome to my house, can be more impactful uh, than anything else that happens after that. So um, uh, never forget rosolio, a wonderful way to welcome your guest. It's also kind of the Italian ciao, right? In, in Italy, we use ciao to say hello and goodbye. Rosolio is a ciao and it's a ciao. It's a hello and a goodbye. Um, we are going to move on. I'm going to plow through because we do have a lot to talk about, but I will, of course, check in with questions. We'll move on to the next region, which is right adjacent, and we're going to go, it's adjacent to the east, of course, and it's called Lombardia. Its capital city, which is Milano, is a global a hub of, of course, fashion and finance and food and um, and beautiful Gothic Duomo di Milano Cathedral and Santa Maria delle Grazie Convent. Um, this is, of course, where Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper is housed. I wonder if there was a little digestivo in that Last Supper picture, maybe a little uh, fernet, which, of course, is a product of this area. North of Milan is Lake Como, which is an upscale alpine resort with dramatic scenery. And here, local dishes, again, are very hearty, right? We're looking at an area where the weather can be cold and food plays a big role in staying at home. So things like the cotoletta milanese or the ossobuco are predominantly uh, pr uh, inventions of this area. And of course, in 1815, uh, a very cool thing happened, which is where Amaro, which was when Amaro Ramazzotti was put on the market. Now, Amaro Ramazzotti has some really uh, breathtaking stories as well, because Alzano Ramazzotti was the first person to put on the shelves of a store for sale uh, a, pro a liqueur that was made from grain and not from grapes. Now, we know that Italy is a country of grapes and grape-influenced products were extremely important. And so Alzano Ramazzotti created uh, Amaro Ramazzotti in 1815, and it's, he, he used basically a blend of 33 fruits, herbs, roots, and the Mediterranean orange, which plays a big role. Now, Amaro Ramazzotti is what I like to call a pastry-style Amaro. It's very uh, fruit-forward, very uh, almond-like, you would find the flavors in Ramazzotti that you would find inside of a pastry shop. Almond, marzipan, all those wonderful flavors. But in this area, right, was also the birth of Fernet, which is the extreme opposite. So the Amari of this region, and quite honestly of every region of Italy, cannot be pinpointed as having one style. They can go from easy drinking, sweet, delicious, yummy, uh, chewy, uh, cheesecake shoved inside my glass before I sip it, flavor profile, all the way to Fernet, which is very dry, higher in alcohol, extremely bitter, and incredibly much more medicinal. Uh, other ingredients you would find inside of a bottle of Ramazzotti are roseberry, gentian, quinine, myrrh, uh, hyssop, and turmeric. So of course, these products were made to help stimulate our digestion and, of course, our appetite, because with these bitter components, it triggers a defensive system. Our body thinks that we are we have ingested poison, and the mechanism that it, the enzymes that it that our body releases in order to defend ourselves from the poison, actually stimulates our salivary glands and it stimulates our appetite and it also triggers our digest digestion. Pretty brilliant, right? Um, so uh, th there's that with that. Um, in 1996, just for, for um, uh, to uh, finish the story on Ramazzotti, they transferred their production to Canelli in Piedmont, but uh, Ramazzotti is still very much so a symbol of the city of Milan and you cannot walk through any street of Milan without a billboard, a sign, or, and you cannot walk into a bar without the proud display of Ramazzotti from Milano.
Um, we'll we'll uh, let's talk about this region a little bit more, and then we'll jump into this question. Also, in this region, in the city of Brescia, which of course is where we were, what we were talking about early earlier with the cocktail Pirlo, we can find a company called Polini Distillates. Um, and this is one of the largest beverage groups in Italy. They manage a large portfolio of a very uh, nice list of brands, uh, but this is one of the top aperitivo cities. So while they manage the original Fernet, which is Vitone, of course, because we are in an aperitivo city, I take advantage to, you, to uh, use their product called MySpritz. MySpritz is a aperitivo. It comes in two different versions. One of them is your typical red aperitivo liqueur, which you can use as an ingredient inside your cocktail to make things like a spritz or even a lighter version of the Pirlo. Uh, but the one that I'm drinking here is a ready to drink. You pop the cap and you pour it inside just like I did and you drink it and you enjoy it. And I'm going to do that. Um, now, why is this important culturally? Extremely culturally important because in Italy, the evolution of the bar came from a lot of tea shops, coffee shops, ice cream stands. They were not originally cocktail bars. And so when you walk into a bar in Italy, what's front and center is the espresso machine, not the, uh, you know, not the lineup of the bitter bottles. The bottles of the liqueurs are over here, over there, on the bottom, because most bars, whether they were born 200 years ago or 100 years ago, which is kind of when the transition happened. Remember, it was in the early 1900s where cities in Italy started getting public lighting. And public lighting made it possible for people to walk around at nighttime. And so the daytime establishments became nighttime establishments by putting liqueur bottles in their, in their, uh, in their spots. And so with that came, comes the fact that most Italian bartenders during the day are baristas more so than bartenders. And so there's a change of shift in the afternoon where your bartender is much more proficient in cocktails, but during the day, they're much more proficient in espresso, teas, juices, uh, slices of pizzas, all those other things that a Italian cafe will, um, uh, will offer. So RTDs are a big part of the culture because at noon, you're not going in there and asking for a barrel aged acid washed, uh, triple infused, uh, handshaken Negroni with a double strain. You just need a very quick pop the bottle aperitivo. So culturally, RTDs are extremely popular in, in Italy, especially during uh, the day. Um, any questions before we jump, we move forward for me? Yes, actually, there's one that's perfect for this. It says, how okay. is the Pirlo different from the Bicetta? Very, very good question. Oh, I love it. I love it. So the Pirlo is different from the Bicicletta because the Bicicletta, uh, so the Bicicletta has, of course, a different wine. You have to remember wine is a big thing in Italy, right? So three ounces of a wine from one region, region versus three ounces of wine from another region can be extremely uh, uh, can be extremely um, uh, different. Now, inside the bicicletta, there's also gin, right? And so the bicicletta can be uh, a little stronger in alcohol. And so the addition of the gin, the uh, the different st uh, style of wine makes the drink completely different. Now, there's also another similar drink called Aragosta, which Aragosta is another name for the bicicletta. What is the difference between the Aragosta and the bicicletta? The mathematical answer, right, without adding in any culture, is that the wine is different. And uh, of course, the region's wine will, will make the difference. But the real answer is also that these drinks will also be made very differently in, in bars you go into, right? So if you go into the, the, the various small taverns, coffee shops, osteria, et cetera, et cetera, you'll see that um, not every uh, pirlo is made the same way. Not every uh, bicicleta is made the same way. Not every aragosta is made the same way. But predominantly the local ingredient. Number one thing, when you put three ounces of white wine and your white wine comes from here, it's going to be, it, by the way, that's over 50% of the cocktail, 
it's going to be very different than you if you use a different type of white wine. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. That's all we have for now. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so now let's take a leap to the southeast. We're going to go to Veneto. Uh, this region stretches from the Dolomite Mountains all the way to the Adriatic Sea. The capital city here is Venice, of course. It's famous for its wonderful canals and Gothic ar architecture. And, and of course, uh, the wonderful Carnival celebration. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's of course, a city of parties. Um, Veneto was part of a very powerful republic, uh, the Venetian Republic, for over a thousand years. And of course, this is uh, the region where the Spritz, or more commonly known by the Austrian Hungari Hungarians who invented it in this region, the Spritz, uh, was created. And now near the Alpine Lake uh, Garda in, in medieval Verona is also where the setting of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was. Uh, was set. So it's also an extremely romantic city. Um, local foods here include La Polenta. Of course, you cannot go there without La Polenta and Grana Padano, which I believe is in uh, probably almost every household uh, in the world uh, or as close as possible. Um, in, the, in a little town called Schiavon in the, prod, in the province of Vicenza, there's a producer of grappa, a very popular one called Poli, of course, and they have only been producing, and I say only, uh, been producing grappa since 1898. Um, they distill, uh, here's beautiful bottles, by the way, when, um, when American vodka producers started becoming more... Uh, um, cognizant of really good marketing, the two places they went to find pretty bottles was grappa producers in Italy and cologne perfume producers in the cologne market because the bottles that these people make are a piece of art in its own way, let alone the distillate itself. Poli distills exclusively fresh grape promise coming from the wineries of the area. They do not step out of their region. They do not like to do that. Uh, the still that they use to distill this product is one of the oldest in the region, as one of the oldest in the country. Um, they have very simple five principles. They only choose the freshest raw material. They distill it immediately, right? No, no time to lapse. They use a historic um, uh, discontinuous still. They work with consistency and passion, and they respect the distillate and the consumer. These are their five uh, pillars of how they produce a product. Now, I'm going to add a little bit more to that. Um, Jacopo, who, set, who is, you know, the current uh, producer of, uh, Jacopo Poli, who is the current owner amongst his, his brothers and sisters of the Poli producer, is son of Giobatta. And the name, the, 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 the name of Giobatta goes down all the way to like, 1890 something. So there is a proud, proud of ownership in the name of the product, and when they put their name on their product, it is a symbol of 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 uh, warranty, and it is also, of course, a tradition that will go on for years and years and years. Um, I like, of course, the one that I've been using the most. It's way up on the top shelf over there. It's Chiara di Moscato. It is my absolute favorite. Uh, varietal. Uh, they make this with a white musket gate from uh, grape from the Euganian Hills. And of course, it's bottled at, uh, at, um, at 40 proof. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, Amy just pointed out to me, uh, Giobatta and Antonio, who are the two um, uh, who, who uh, so it was Jacopo, son of Giobatta, son of Antonio, son of Giobatta, son of Antonio, son of Giobatta. It actually goes all the way down to 1749. Can you imagine the pride in putting your name on a product like that? Um, Grappa has come a long way since we've known it. Um, I have found an old Italian cocktail that was made in um, 19, well, it was found in a 1947 cocktail book. It was called the Lloyd Cardinal, and it was made, I'm reciting it, so um, forgive me if I don't remember it precisely, but it was one ounce of grappa, a half ounce of a aged brandy, uh, a half ounce of maraschino, a half ounce of orgeat, and a half ounce of lemon juice shaken and strained. Now, 
all of those ingredients I've bartended in Italy are very commonly used in Italy. Uh, but why am I saying this? Because it's an older cocktail, it is my belief that the concept of adding one ounce of grappa and a half an ounce of an aged brandy such as a cognac was due to the fact that back then grappas still needed to be discovered and some of them were still very harsh. That is not the case today. Everybody I enjoy grappa with, and I'm a big uh, grappa proponent in this house. When people step into my house, they have to drink grappa with me. They, I always see a, a surprised face of how floral and how perfumey and how elegant and refined the spirit, which was called jet fuel for so many years, far from jet fuel. Actually, I can name 10 other distillates that should be called jet fuel far before grappa should. And the reason why this happens is, is because when you are making grappa, you are distilling a solid, you are not distilling a liquid. And because of that, you can't just put it under a flame. What happens when you add something um, dry under a flame, it starts burning, right? And so because of that, the method that is utilized to distill grappa is so delicate and so refined that that delicacy and that refinement shows up in the final product. So grappa all day long. And, uh, and of course, you have to remember also that grappa is an amazing digestivo. Why is it a digestivo? Of course, alcohol does in many way promote digestion, right? There's, there's studies to that, but all products that have alcohol have alcohol, right? The concept of grappa being part of a digestivo is part of a long culture of sipping grappa after a meal, which promotes your digestion, which puts you, which puts you mentally into a position of appreciating that your meal is over. Uh, we're going to keep on running, and uh, if there, I'll, I'll ask questions on the next one. Now, let's take a leap down. We're going to go to Emilia Romagna. It's a region, of course, we're still in northern um, Italy, and it extends all the way to the to, uh, from uh, the Apennine Mountains to the Po River in the north. Um, this is a, an, an amazing, amazing place. Um, there's a, a beautiful city called Ravenna near the Adriatic coast. It is famed for the uh, brightly colored Byzantine mosaics. And then Daniela taught me something the other day that Bologna, which is of course in Emilia Romagna, is called La Dotta, La Grassa, e La Rossa. La Dotta because it was where the first university in the world was, clearly very smart people there. La Grassa because famous food, and La Rosa because everything there is made of bricks. Now, local dishes here, um, we are still in an area where food is very rich. We're still in an area where, of course, tomatoes can be found everywhere, but we're not quite where the tomato uh, hits so many meals quite yet, despite the fact that lasagna is made here. Uh, but tortellini in, in Brodo is one of the uh, common dishes that you would find here in this uh, in this area. Now, also, you will find a producer here called Cazzoni. Cazzoni, oops, let me twist the bottle the right way. There it is. Cazzoni is one of the oldest distilleries and liqueur factories uh, that you will find in, in, in Italy. Um, it's very family owned, so you can, so, all their know-how has been transferred down from generation to generation. The reason why it says 1814 on the very top, because 1814 is exactly uh, when this when this um, uh, company was founded. The, uh, uh, this product here is the aperitivo. It comes from an original recipe of the Cazzoni family that is uh, bottled at 15% alcohol by volume. The way they make it is they select local har local herbs, and of course they harvest it, and they blend it with Mediterranean fruit uh, and seeds. And, uh, and so this product here is gonna have a very light, bittersweet flavor that is ideal for all sorts of uh, light and sessionable cocktails, such as the Sprit. Set that back right there. Okay, any questions that I should uh, be mindful of? No, we're all good for now. Okay, fantastico. Thank you, Daniela. Okay, another step down and a little bit to east, we're going to go to Le Marche. 
which sits in between the Apennine Mountains and the Adriatic Sea. Its capital city is Ancona, which is a port city. And there are, so there's, of course, a lot of, of um, uh, influences from uh, uh, things coming from all over the world. Uh, in the city, you'll find sandy coves, limestone cliffs, and a lot of medieval villages. This is a beautiful place where you can just um, walk through these villages and really get lost. Um, Pesaro in this region, in the city of Pesaro, is the birthplace of renowned opera composer Rossini. And why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant because this means that music is in their blood. And when they get drunk, they probably sing better than most other people. It's in their culture. Uh, the inland countryside is dotted with fortified hilltop settlements. And of course, here is where uh, we have the Mont Sibillini uh, National Park. And of course, um, a lot of the popular dishes that you'll will have here, because of course, the proximity to the sea are the mosholi mussels and a lot of stuffed olives, which of course are a big part of many aperitivi uh, snacks and foods that you will see. In the city of Macerata, there's a very, very cool distillery called Varnelli. Uh, it was founded in 1868. And uh, again, these companies have been doing this for over a century. They have perfected what they do in a very nice way. So one of the reasons why I always like to say, if you're going to buy Amari, if you're going to buy Limoncelli, if you're going to buy these products, if they come from Italy, stick with Italy because there is a perfected recipe that is um, that has been time tested for centuries, and you really can't get that from many other places. So the Stilario Varnelli is a historical company. It has very strong ties to its territories, to its territory, and they only use all natural ingredients. Now, one of the things that you will see. Um, uh, is uh, is one of the products that you see here is Amaro del Herborista. Now, Amaro del Herborista is a digestif, and it's bottled at 21%, still low in alcohol, but this one here falls as a very dry, non-sugary, um, uh, pine-flavored uh, 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 Amaro. And what's very cool about it is the honey that is used to slightly sweeten this product, of course, comes from those wonderful Monti Sibillini, which is very close. Everything they do here is handmade. The herbs and the roots and the barks are still ground by mortar. Who does this anymore? Who does it anymore, right? And so rather than finding a new way to make the same product, even the generations that have come after have um, honored the traditions of making the product the same way. So very, very unique product here, founded in 1868. I'm gonna just look at my time. Okay, I have to move a little faster. Okay, we're gonna go a little bit down more. Now we're in Lazio, uh, which is a region bordering the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, the central region bordering the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, of course, the capital city here isn't just, is, is Rome, which we believe is not just the capital of Italy, but it is the capital of the world. And it was the heart of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, why is Rome so important? If you are ever in Rome and you go to Appia Antica, you make sure that you walk into these old uh, uh, bars. They were called thermopoliums. And you will see that a bar that is th that you will walk into today, perhaps a bar opened a year ago, perhaps a brand new construction, still has very similar layout as a 2000 year old thermopolium from Rome. Even the little scaled back bars, the height of the countertops. So of course, Rome was a city of gathering and uh, on the coast of the ancient port of Ostia, again, you'll find detailed mosaics and a theater. And of course, uh, the iconic ruins of the Colosseum are here too. An incredible city to enjoy a drink and an incredible city to enjoy art and to enjoy um, ancient ruins. Rome has so much to brag about that we only can scratch the surface of all the beauty that this wonderful region of Lazio and city of Rome uh, ha have, to, have to offer. Food here, the most common foods that you would find 
arrabbiata and carbonara, two amazing pasta dishes that are actually, they come across as being very heavy, but actually when you eat them in Rome, they are made in a way where you just basically ate a salad. You can go run a marathon after a carbonara in Rome. Um, in Lazio's capital city, Rome, of course, is where Pallini uh, company was founded. I'm going to pick up this bottle right here. Um, and Pallini is one of Rome's uh, oldest and most representative uh, liqueur companies. Uh, it was founded in 1875. And in 1999, they launched this project, this product, which is Pallini Limoncello. It's made from the infusion of non-pesticides, Fusato lemons, which come from the Amalfi Coast. These lemons are very special, very important, uh, because they're not extremely uh, generous in flavor, but what is very generous is their peel has essential oils with very, very delicious citrusy flavors. These large lemons, they are hand peeled uh, without the pith, and then they're vacuum sealed, and then they are infused within 24 hours. They add them to the pure alcohol, um, that alcohol is made from sugar beet, and then they sweeten it with Italian beet sugar. And so this product here is basically a very nice um, alcoholic lemonade, for lack of a better term, on steroids. So delicious. I always like to say one of the greatest food pairing items you can try, you take a sip, you swirsh it around, you swallow, the aftertaste kicks in, right? The aftertaste is what is those particles that is left on your palate after you swallowed. It's very lemony. And what do you put on lemon? Well, what food wants lemon? A lot of fried food, like the cotoletta from Milano that we were talking about, or fried chicken, which of course is a very popular drink. So limoncello is an extremely food-friendly type of product. Okay. We're gonna move down. We're gonna go just south of Lazio. We're gonna to go to uh, the region where I grew up, which is La Campania. It's in southwestern Italy, of course, and it's known for its uh, ancient ruins and dramatic coastline. Naples, which is the capital city, is a highly energetic city. If you see those kids riding their scooters on the on the sidewalk, uh, you know, running errands. I was one of those ones, so don't make fun of me. Um, you know, we're a very busy society over there, busy doing a lot of stuff. Um, of course, this is uh, it's a, the, the setting of, of, of this area is so beautiful because you have the gray cone of Mount Vesuvius, and then you have the deep blue waters of the Vesuvia, of the uh, Gulf of Naples, which have a wonderful contrast, almost similar to what you'll see here. It's like living in a postcard. What a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful uh, place of the world. To the south of the uh, of the Amalfi of uh, the Amalfi Coast, there are beautiful pastel cities such as Positano, Amalfi, Ravello, and it's just a very colorful place to live. Um, Campania's foods, of course, the Napolitan pizza, the Caprese salad. These are the most uh, common ones. Maybe the eggplant parmesan are the ones that we are most uh, common with. But in the um, region's northern city of Benevento, you'll still find a building where in 1860, this historical liqueur called Strega was born. It's still made by the distillation of, of about 70 herbs. And the funny thing about this is that Benevento is only four miles away from Salerno. Now it was in 1100 in Salerno where a lot of the practice of learning how to put medicinal herbs inside of a product uh, was, was all, all those studies were done. So this product is from the 1860s, but it's, um, its recipe could very much so be from hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of years before that. Um, so uh, it, it gets this really, among the, the um, ingredients that you'll find in here, you'll find the Ceylon cinnamon, the Florentine iris, the Italian juniper, which is why it's very junipery and you could sometimes even confuse it with, um, with a gin if you don't know what is, uh, if you don't see the color, of course. The color, by the way, of course, it comes from the beautiful, um, uh, what's the name I'm looking for, from, from the saffron, which gives it this really natural yellow color. So you're not getting anything in natural in this product. Bottled at 40% alcohol by volume, and of course, distributed all over the world. Such an incredible product here. 
Um, last but not least, we're gonna we're gonna make our last stop, and then we'll open it up for questions. Just south, just south of Campania is a region called Basilicata, full of forests and mountains. It borders with Calabria and Puglia, and um, in the city of the uh, in, in the city of Matera is known for the Sassi district, uh, which is a vast hillside of cave dwellings. And, and this area dates back to thousands of years and just another beautiful picturesque uh, part of the country. In the, nor in the region's northern town of Pistici is where Amaro Lucano was, was, is produced. The name Lucano takes its name from the region, of course, which is Lucania, which is another way to call Basilicata. So of course, these products, even in their name, they're very proud of their region. Not many uh, products uh, across the world take a name from their geography. Of course, this is a typical example. This product here is a delicate blend of 30 herbs. It's bottled at 28% alcohol by volume. And I like to call this a very much so perfect balance between herbs and that pastry style that we were talking about. So if you don't know what Amaro you would like to drink, and if you don't know what Amaro you like, Amari can be very bitter, Amari can be very sweet. Um, which one do you like? If you take a sip of Lucano, right? Lucano starts very bitter and ends very sweet. It actually has both characteristics in there and they're able to stop at the, at the at the 50% mark and take over with the new flavor. So if you like Lucano in its first half of your palate, then you really like medicinal style Amari. And so you should lean more towards uh, Fernet or uh, Amaro del Herborista. If you liked the second part of Lucano, which was sweet, then you go more towards the Ramazzotti and the Averna, but of course, you're probably gonna like Lucano, so you should stick with that one because it just has a very unique flavor. And I believe that um, any bar that has a, a serious Amaro program should have Lucano because of that um, uh, characteristic. A little bit about uh, more about this family. Amaro uh, Lucano is, is produced by a family called the Vena family. They have a very rich history. And in the, 19, in the year 1900, they became they gained a lot of fame throughout the Kingdom of Italy because the, Fen the Vena family became the official supplier to the House of Savoy, whose coat of arms appears on the label, and they do that very proudly. Um, so sometimes these little shields and medals and things that we find on bottles of Italian products, they actually have a meaning of tradition, and tradition is a big deal. Um, I am going to go ahead and leave open time for questions. Uh, hopefully, I didn't go over too much. We had, we did have a lot to visit today. You were fantastic. Um, so we have one question from Dale, and he asks, "Is there a famous local cocktail made with strega?" No, there's not. Um, I like to when I. It's a very good question. So the question was, "Is there a is there a famous local cocktail made with strega?" There's not. Believe it or not, America and the UK have taught us Italians uh, more so than we believed how much mixable strega really is. In Italy, we just like to drink it as a cocktail because it is a cocktail, right? It has over 70 ingredients in it. Um, so we drink it on the rocks or we sometimes we can put it on an ice cream, which is why when I make a strega cocktail, true to my Italian tradition, I usually make a sgropino, right? So a sgropino is basically lemon sorbet topped with a little bit of Prosecco. And on the bottom of it, before you spin or you whisk, it's typically a whisked intermezzo, you would put a little bit of citrus vodka. Well, instead of putting citrus vodka, I put strega because I love that piney and minty. It's very minty eucalyptic flavor that it would give to a sgropino. So perfect for what is an intermezzo. What is an intermezzo? It's something that you would serve, of course, between perhaps a fish meal and a, and a between fish and meat, something that would cleanse your palate. And so I'm not just saying I throw that in there because it's a good idea, because of course, piney and eucalyptic flavors are very good to cleanse your palate. Good question. Thank you.
Um, then another one is how would you suggest to substitute Italian uh, products that we just saw in this webinar in typical uh, American cocktails? Oh, what a fascinating question. Well, so um, I, I wish it, I wish I could I wish I could um, I wish I had a little more uh, specific whether it were equal per equal or completely different. But the the very short answer is this, right? A cocktail is is always made of at least two components, uh, but it could be as much it could be many more. There's always a base. There's a base spirit, which is gin, vodka, rum, tequila, grappa, brandy, any of those. Then there's a modifier, which is typically a liqueur or a fortified wine. Then there's a mixer, which is typically a juice or a soda. And then there's an accent, which is a dash of bitters or maybe this the the press of a little uh, zest of an orange or a lemon. Now, a cocktail does not have to have all four of those, but typically it has two, right? Otherwise, it's just a glass of something. Um, when you are trying to Italianize an, a, a cocktail from anywhere, understand what ingredient you are working with. And I will give you just a very basic example. Let's just say that I have a black Russian in front of me, and it is vodka and Kahlua which is typically two ounces of vodka, one ounce of Kahlua. I can take the vodka out, right? And I can replace it with grappa in the exact same proportion. And then I can take the Kahlua out, right? And either, either I can put Varnelli Cafe Mocha, which is a coffee liqueur, or I can even play even broader than that and put one ounce of the Strega inside. So now what used to be vodka and Kahlua is now grappa and strega and that is very delicious and it has a flavor of its own how do we know that's going to work because cocktails are templates very simply right the two to one ratio of a spirit with a liqueur works 99.9 percent .9 of the times um i will take it broader to something that has more ingredients in it just so i can give you the other spectrum and make it give you a more difficult answer let's say we take a cosmopolitan citrus vodka uh triple stack, lime juice, and cranberry juice. Very wonderful example. Okay, we can take out the citrus vodka, right? And we can add perhaps that grappa again or an Italian brandy. We can take out that Cointreau or that triple sec and we can put in perhaps Italicus or we can put in perhaps the aperitivo or we can even put in perhaps the Polini. So we're gonna replace that liqueur from wherever it is with a Italian liqueur. And then perhaps the lemon or the lime juice and the cranberry, we can keep that the same, completely different experience and completely balanced cocktail will come out. Thank you. I really like that Kahlua cocktail that you said earlier. Um, another question is with the, it's a little bit more broad. So with the, what trends do you see in the market that are developing and where do you think that Italian spirits would fall at these trends? I mean, listen, there, th that is a, such a good question. And um, the, the reality is that uh, Amari are here to stay for a very long time. And the, the, the back bar uh, presence of Amari is going to expand. Um, and and the reason is is because they really do bring a unique flavor that is really hard to reproduce. Now with that, of course, comes a, a a total fascination for Italian products. So perhaps people are going to understand that you can carry more than just one style of aperitivi. It's not always just aperol. You can carry a couple because they do differ. And same things with bitter, right? You you don't just have to carry Campari, perhaps you can carry a couple more, and those come with so many uh, nice regional differences. Uh, however, the biggest trend that I see that is coming to stay is, is the aperitivo ritual from Italy. Think about this, right? In Italy and in America, hopefully soon, a person can get out of work and with $24 plus tax and tip, they can walk into a uh, bar and have a drink, eat very savory, delicious, zesty, umami food, listen to music, 
and socialize and kind of talk about the day. Now, in a time like this where money isn't going to be the most, the biggest thing we can go out and spend, low cost luxury is, is going to become even more and more popular. So I don't see why every city in America isn't uh, going to embrace the aperitivo hour where for, let's call it 30 bucks all in, their consumer can come in, drink, eat, socialize, listen to music, and do it in a luxurious way. So the aperitivo ritual, of course, I know that the people that are on the uh, webinar today are very informed. And so for them, the aperitivo ritual is like, so two years ago, right? Oh, we heard about that. But the reality is from a mainstream standpoint, we haven't even scratched the surface. It's coming, baby. Yeah, that's all the questions we have that I've um, what you very, said. very good. So thank you. All right. Well, I want to, I'll just close it off and then Carlos, I'll hand it to you. I just do want to remind everybody to uh to uh incorporate Italian products into their life because they are truly a gem and they have really uh, influenced us today, uh, influenced what we drink today. Um, and uh, I wanna thank everybody for um, uh, being on the call today. And with that, I will check out and I'll leave, uh, I'll leave it to Carlos. Well, I think you've already convinced everyone to incorporate Italian spirits. You certainly convinced me. So I just wanna say a big, huge thank you to uh, Livio for just another absolutely fantastic and informative session. I'm gonna need you to send me a bottle of each of those ones, the poster and the best book. You put that in the mail by tomorrow, that'd be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, but in, in all seriousness, thank you so much. And thank you to the Italian Trade Agency. Thank you to um, Daniela and to Paola and to uh, Trade Commissioner Antonino. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic, very extremely informative. I'm glad we got a lot of questions coming in. Um, this was the last webinar of the series, but in case, I think we mentioned it before, if you missed previous events, the recordings will be available on our website, barcommonbrooklyn.com, um, and they will also be on YouTube. So with that, uh, once again, molto, molto bene. Thank you so much again. Salud. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.